Hello! It is so beautiful outside today. Um, so I decided to do this Facebook Live outside to enjoy the crisp, clean, beautiful fall weather that we're having here in North Carolina and share this beautiful oh, energy with you. Um, so real time, real life. My husband is just now pulling up. He doesn't know when I do Facebook Lives and also my puppies are here on the deck. So <laughs> this is real. Okay, so October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month and this every year, this is the month where I really show up big for you to show you the emotional part of the domestic violence, right? The, the abuse that you can't see, right? Mina. Um, because when we think of abuse, we immediately go to the physical and the sexual part of it. Um, but the emotional part is the most common part of abuse. It's what I call the silent abuse. It's the part that you can't see. It's the part that's not a crime, right? Because the physical abuse, you can, and I, and I write about that, you can call the police and there's an actual crime involved. With the emotional, there is no, you're on your own, so to speak. So what I'm going to do today is um, I'm going to read to you chapter three in my book, Empower the Woman Within, Stepping into Total Freedom. Um, and I'm going to give you an assignment at the end, um, an actual um, an action step for you to do, uh, for you to peel, shed, and heal back the layers to who you really are. This is what I tell my clients all the time. Um, okay, so before we get started, I'm just going to wait for my... Yeah. I mean, if they're going to sit here and bark, yeah. Probably will. Yeah. And I got to get my bike out there. Okay. How long? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're probably good. Probably good. <laughs> okay. So, um, focus, focus, Denise. Okay. Chapter three. Let's do this. This is the longest chapter in my book. It's also the most emotion. I feel it's the most emotional um, part of the book. It's where I really get into the biggest trauma that I've ever experienced in my life. The biggest, um, and my children, of course, too. Um, at the time, my children were 14 and 15. Um, and so, in the beginning of all of the chapters in my book, I have a quote. It's not my quote, but it's a quote. And it's it pertains to the topic. It, it pertains to the chapter, right? It, it goes in with it. So this quote is, without rain, nothing grows. Learn to embrace the storms of your life. It's an ebuddhism.com quote. I love Buddha. Okay, here we go, my loves. The beginning of our end. Let's fast forward to 2008. By this time, we've been through lots of drug use, abuse, depression, and me holding on to our marriage and family by a thin string. What was about to happen would finally rock my world. In fact, it crumbled my kids and me down to our core. We were never the same after August 24th, 2008. I'm getting a little anxious, a little anxiety right now as I I know what I'm about to write here. I've talked about this so many times before and believe me, it took so much courage for me to start to talk about this publicly, but I had to. How could I help other women if I wasn't owning my own story, my own truth? This traumatic event is emotional poison for my children and I. What we went through was something that no one should ever have to endure in life in this lifetime. But unfortunately, I hear a lot. This happens a lot. Um, I hear actually I hear even worse case scenarios than the one that I'm about to share with you. Okay. But especially for a 14 and a 15 year old, 
child to see their dad this way, to see their mom respond in this way, and everything that happened in between. On this day, we were fighting over me starting my own business. This is 2008. A network marketing business that sold sex toys. I had discussed this opportunity with him prior to me signing up, and he agreed. We even told, he even told me to buy the bigger starting packet instead of the smaller one. Okay, I thought. He's on board, and wow, I finally have something of my own. A business. I can grow and meet new people and travel and all the good stuff that I was really looking forward to and experiencing. So we had been arguing bad since July of that year. So remember, this is August 24th that I'm talking about. When our daughter and I had moved from our newly built home about two hours away from where we were located at the moment, um, um, two hours away from my parents' house, which was in Hollywood, Florida. So now let me go back. In 2006, when the housing market was booming, we sold our four bedroom house to build a new house in the country. And what we were really trying to do was leave our problems behind in South Florida. How many of you have done that, right? You moved to try to get away from the problems. So we thought a new beginning in a completely new environment would solve all of our problems. Well, that didn't work out. Duh. <laughs> so we ended up back in South Florida, but still having the newly built home that isn't selling because now, now I'm back in 2008, the housing market had crashed. During this time, my husband, my then husband was heavily into steroids again and whatever cocktail pills he was taking. So he suddenly changes his mind about me starting my own business and says no. And remember, this relationship was really controlling. So this started a war between him and I. But now I was 38 years old and sick and tired of his bullshit. Hot and cold, nice and mean, yes and no. Repeatedly, I had endured his toxic behavior, but this time I was done. I was a grown woman, a wife, a mom, and I can do whatever I want to do with my life. This attitude of mine did not sit well with him because I was in control and demanding that I want what I want, and he was feeling out of control. I told him I was over this bullshit and wanted a divorce. I had said this many times before, but this time it was different. Maybe it was because all of the years of the self-abuse he had put on himself with the cocktail of pills. Maybe it was the deep depression that he was in, but hid it well from us. Maybe it was because we were living in my parents' house and I could easily afford living there. I don't know what it was that day, but this time it was different when I said, I want a divorce. I knew he was depressed. I knew he was taking pills and I knew he was unstable, but never in a million years did I think he would do what he did next. I asked our 14 year old son to ask his dad who was in our bedroom all by himself all morning long if he wanted anything from Publix. It's a local grocery store. He said no. So my son and I left to the store. Our 15 year old daughter was in the shower. I was gone for about 30 minutes. What I had came to home to was shocking, disbelieving, and it shook our world down to the core forever. When I came home, I see my husband on the floor with our daughter clutching him in her arms. She looked up at me hysterically crying. I will never, ever forget the look in her eyes. She was scared, confused, hurt, in pain, and in a panic. His head laid on her lap while she was calling 911 and left, and his left leg had a towel tightly wrapped around his thigh as he was moaning in pain. Whew. There was a blood trail from the bedroom to the hallway where they both were. She continued to hysterically cry while she was on the phone with the 911 operators. I walked in 
and my eyes opened so wide as I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My first thought was that he had stabbed himself. I don't know why I thought this because I know he has guns. Maybe this was the mind's way of protecting me from the truth until I could get things in control. I grabbed the phone from my daughter and started to tell the 911 operator the address. She stated that the police were on their way. I screamed at him. Are you crazy? Are you fucking crazy? What the fuck did you do? As I walked around him and followed the blood trail into the bedroom. I was observing the scene to try to figure out what had happened here. My daughter went into the protective mode and said, Mom, please. He was laying on my on the floor, moaning in pain. The police came, about 20 of them. They were all up and down our street and approaching the house with guns. They did this because our daughter did not want to tell the operator that her dad had shot himself because she thought he would get in trouble. So the police did not know who shot him and if they were dealing with an intruder or what had happened. So they approached the house with extreme caution. The EMTs took him away and the police immediately separated all three of us, myself, my son, and my daughter, into different rooms to question us to find out what happened. I couldn't help myself. I was feeling so angry. How could he do this with our 15 year old daughter in the next room? What a selfish son of a bitch. Our son had a confused, worrisome look on his face. I was worried for my kids and didn't know what to do. I had so many different mixed up emotions inside and anger was at the top. I was so angry that I didn't even console my kids. I carried a lot of guilt for that right there for many, many years, carried a lot of guilt around that. My daughter was still hysterically crying and being questioned by the police about what happened. There was so, there was no mystery to the puzzle. My husband had attempted suicide. This was the ultimate control tactic. So as a mom and a wife, I was left to pick up the pieces and help my kids and my husband. The next few hours felt like a lifetime of waiting and time stood still for us. I had so many feelings running through me. I was angry, scared, worried, embarrassed, ashamed, lost, helpless. I felt ruined. What was I gonna do now? Our world as we knew it was gone forever. We stayed at the house as they took my husband to the hospital by ambulance. I immediately went into mom mode and was taking care of things. The police informed me that while I clean up the mess, my kids should not be in the house. I thought, really? How could I leave my kids now? I know that they were saying this for the best, but I just couldn't do it. So I called my sister who lived about five minutes away and told her what happened. And she stayed with them in another room while I started to clean up the blood trail from the bedroom to the hallway. A lot of a lot of this part is a blur for me. I'm gonna tell you everything that I can remember. I just took the bed comforter and threw it out because apparently he was sitting on the edge of the bed when he shot himself. So there was just no way, so there was just way too much blood to try to clean up. And did I really want that comforter anyway? No. I mopped and cleaned everywhere there was blood. See, there's a spot here that I can't remember. I guess that when, I, that when the police had us three separated in the different rooms asking us what happened, they must have, there must have been when they went into the room and found a suicide letter and his pills everywhere. He was so addicted to the pills that while our daughter had his head on her lap and calling the police, he told her, don't let them see the pills. And she replied hysterically crying, okay, daddy. 
the pills started back in 1998 when our kids were just four and five years old. He would self-medicate and get whatever he could get his hands on. But in the years later, he found out about oxycodone and oxycontin. They call them blues on the street and Valium. But honestly, I don't know what else he was taking. So by 2008, it had been about 10 years of him dabbling in a sea of pills. By now, a few hours had passed by and my kids were begging me to take them to the hospital to see their dad. I honestly do not want to go see him. But I was still, because I was still so freaking angry at what had transpired that day. What he did was crazy to me. I remember driving to the hospital that evening and thinking, what if we get there and he's dead? This is the start of having heavy, heavy feelings like this one inside of me on a regular basis like 24 seven. When we got to the hospital, he couldn't, we couldn't see him, but didn't know this until waiting in the waiting room for a few hours. Finally, a male nurse came out and explained that my husband told the nurse that he didn't want to see us. So we left and went home. Later, I found out that he was so drugged up from his own self-medicating and what the hospital had given to him uh, for the emergency surgery. Therefore, he said what he said to the nurse. I can only go by, you know, picking up the pieces. <laughs> I thought it was a bug. I thought a bug land on me. So my kids were so crushed by this news but we had been through such an energy draining day that grabbing some pizza and going home sounded really good right now. As soon as we pulled up to the house with the pizza in hand and a, the hospital phone number had called me, it was my husband asking in the, I remember him, his voice was so um, soft is the word that's coming up for me. His voice was just so low, so weak, I guess. And he said, where are you? And I said, you didn't want to see us. He replied crying. What? Of course I want to see you guys come back. So we did. And this was the start of him confused minute by minute and us trying to help him. I remember all three of us sitting around the hospital bed in silence that night. There were no words for what happened earlier that day. We were all in shock of what had transpired. So we all sat around his hospital bed in silence. We were not alone in the hospital room as he was on suicide watch. This means a nurse's aide can never leave him alone, not even to go to the bathroom. I remember looking at my husband's hand and seeing dried up blood in between his fingers. So I quickly took a wet cloth and wiped and dried up and wiped the dried up blood from his hand. This isn't something that I wanted my kids to see. I looked over at my son and saw tears falling down his face. He was crying in silence. I cried looking at him and his pain. I still do. My son never recovered from this traumatic event. And what happened after to this day, he still struggles. His he still struggles with his childhood and especially with this. I'm tearing up a little bit here. The next few days were me trying to get my kids in school and back to a regular schedule, but nothing about us was regular. This traumatic event had changed all of us forever. My husband was in the hospital for five days on suicide watch which means someone was always there in his room watching him to make sure he didn't hurt himself. Sometimes they would even, <clears throat> sometimes they would leave when I was there. I guess they thought I was sane. Being that he was so addicted to the pills at the hospital and the hospital was only giving him enough to take the edge off, he asked me to bring him pills from home. Initially, I said no. 
But after seeing him go through withdrawals and even busting open his staples on his leg from the pressure of throwing up, unless he did that himself, I gave in and snuck pills from home and brought them to him, but not before I tried to convince the nurse that he needed these pills because of a back injury. And I even brought in his MRI to them so they could see what I was saying was legit. Looking back, I was so much under his spell. I did anything he asked me to do. I felt sorry for him. And I was trying to keep the peace in our marriage. It was easier this way. I was enabling his behavior, but I did not know this at the time. I thought I was being a good wife. I thought I was keeping us together as a family. I thought I was doing the right thing. After five days in the hospital, he was transferred to the psych ward. This was so scary. This was a place that I was not allowing my kids to see. The hospital was one thing, but this place, no way. By this time, I had to contact his family that we had not spoken to in, I don't know, months, years. I don't remember. And they were not my favorite people either. Well, mainly his parents and one of his brothers. I like and get along with his other two brothers. Ah, I'm getting anxiety just thinking of them. These people are so toxic. Okay, I'm breathing through this part because as I write, I am visualizing the moments in my mind. Scary. When they came to meet me at the psych ward, I had to greet them and put on a fake act and say, hello. My stomach is turning right now. Anyway, I took them back to see him and left them with him. I honestly do not remember much of that day. I do remember visiting him in this horrible place and feeling so fucking scared to be there because when you visit a patient, you are right there with the other patients. You're right there with the other people and you don't know what they are there for. Well, you do know. And that's the scary part. My husband was not scared to be there, or at least he didn't show it to me. He was, however, pissed off at me because I was bringing our kids to see him because I wasn't bringing our kids to see him and I wasn't bringing him his pills either. He wouldn't even look at me while I was visiting him every day. I remember sitting there and my heart was just about to pound right out of my chest because I was so scared sitting there with all the other patients. I remember this one girl who was a patient there wearing a white gown and her hair untamed came over and sat right next to me and looked at me and said, I see your pain. Scared is the only emotion I can think of. I was just so scared to be in this environment, to be surrounded by these patients who were Baker acted. So in Florida, that's what it's called when you go into the psych wards, Baker acted. I know every state has a different term, um, but that's the term for, for you being in the psych ward for uh, uh, like 24, 48 hours. It's called Baker acted from their own episode they had. I was scared for my husband being there. I was scared for my kids and what they were going through. And I was scared for me. I was just so scared. It was August 31st, 2008. And it was our 17th wedding anniversary. And things couldn't be so out of the norm and crazy. I went to visit my husband who was still in the psych ward for three days now. And he was giving me the cold shoulder and ignoring me. He wouldn't even look at me. I felt like our whole life, as I knew it, was gone. I felt so alone, so isolated from everything and everyone. I felt like there was no one I could turn to and get the help that we needed. Everything at this point was laying on my shoulders and it was so 
heavy. Most married couples spend their anniversary planning a romantic dinner at their favorite restaurant or a weekend getaway to the beach. Not us. I was visiting my husband in the psych ward because he attempted suicide days prior. And instead of trying to get better, he was refusing everything they offered him. Group counseling, private sessions, etc. I remember leaving him that day hysterically crying, running out of that horrible place, and a male nurse asked me if I was okay. Of course, I replied, yes. I ran to the elevator and just cried my eyes out. I was so upset at where my life was, where our life was. It was bad. It was really bad. It just hit me like a ton of bricks that my life was a train wreck and I'm in that wreck and I'm watching that wreck happen each step of the way. It was so painful to be where I was then. I felt so lost, so helpless, so lonely. I was in this all by myself. I was the one taking on everything that was happening. I was taking care of our kids. I was taking care of my husband. I was taking care of where and how the money was coming in so the bills would get paid. So many aspects and avenues to this whole ordeal that we were in and it was just too much to deal with. That day, the day finally came that he was being released a total of 10 days of being in the hospital and the psych ward. Today was the day. I really felt like, honestly, I don't remember what I felt like. I don't remember if I was feeling relieved or excited or what. But here's what I do remember. I'm going to stop here for a second. And then I'm going to do a part two.